it after if you would like to see it. Um, and like I mentioned in the chat, if you want to ask questions, the chat's a great place to do it. I'll try to monitor it as we're going. And Victoria should be joining shortly for any longer questions as well. We'll be in three seconds today. We'll do the usual, just a quick overview of the main components in case anyone hasn't jumped in and used those yet. Then I will show the basics of getting an IFT webhook connected to Dark. And then I will show you in the third part an application I built ahead of time so you can just see a different example of something that I connected to from IFT that has a little bit more logic in it. So to get started, I am going to share my screen. And I know I've seen some of your names before, so you've probably seen this, but here we are. This is the dark canvas. If you haven't used it before, the basic idea is on this main screen, you're able to create any of the structural components of your backend. And then there is also a separate space where you can make functions that are reusable snippets. You can see here ahead of time, I just pulled in my IFT key. Uh, the website for IFT isn't great, so it's extremely hard for me to show you that website, not reveal my key, uh, and be able to do the demo. So I just did that ahead of time. So when you're thinking about building endpoints in Dark, first one you usually would make would be a hello world. So if we make a API endpoint that is hello, that is hello world, I'm sure you've probably seen this at some point, it's then up and able to be used. When we go back into Dark, we can obviously write more complex logic in this. We can also build post endpoints, things like that. But if we were to greet by name, we can then change our logic to use that variable dynamically so we can greet visitors by name. And if we reopen this, we will say hello to Victoria. We spell Victoria wrong. And when we head back over, you can see the most interesting thing about this is for each of your major backend components, you end up having a set of traces that you're able to use. So an interesting one here is if we select our second trace, so not the one that was a sample, but the one where I first opened the page when we were still just at hello, you can see that I'm getting an incomplete response here and the variable name is underlined in red. And what's going on is that for this trace, we don't have a value for a name, which means we can't execute this. We would be expecting something that is a type string since we're doing a string concatenation and we're not able to do that. Whereas if we shift to this trace, as the one where I spelled it right, where we've said hello Victoria, we can see that the trace does have a return value. And when we open the handler for this trace, we will see the result hello Victoria, like you just saw. Pretty much every single API endpoint in Dark works like this. So the next part, this function itself, you can see while we see the live value here, it just runs automatically because it doesn't have any side effects. Most of the time when you're building something in Dark, you are going to be using functions that have side effects either by making external API calls or by setting things in a data store. So to show you that before we get into building with ift, if I make a REPL, uh, REPLs name themselves a adjective animal combination, just so you can have a reference, you can rename it if you want, so my REPL. Uh, and you can use these to try anything out. So in this case, if I say wanted to talk to an external API, say I'm doing an is your client post. In this case, I'm actually going to post back into dark. What happens is when I add this function, it shows me all of the arguments that I would need to fill in. So here, let's uh, post into the canvas we're in. I don't know if you noticed this when I opened the one before, but there's a separation between where you're editing and your API availability. So this ends up being the domain that your API lives at. We've also recently dramatically increased our support for custom domains. So if you submit a report, uh, request for a custom domain, we can set your API to a domain of your choice. We had a few people launch with this this week. As you can see here, then we'll just add an API endpoint to it and we'll give it some JSON data. Doesn't need a query, doesn't need a header. And so you can see now that I've filled in each of the arguments, this play button, which allows me to interactively use this, turns green, which is a very similar thing to what we'll be doing with IFT. And right now it's underlined because we haven't run our external API call yet. So right now it's saying it returns incomplete. When we run it, uh, we can see now it's replay instead of play. And you can see the response we get. Uh, this is one of my favorite things and why it's pretty easy to use IFT. 
is you get a response in line showing what has happened in result to your HTTP call. And in this case, you can see that we have an error and the route wasn't found. Something that's a little bit unique about this process with Dark and is good to keep in mind when working with external APIs is that there is a concept of an error rail. You may have noticed this before, but there's a set of functions which go to the error rail, including the HTTP client functions. And this allows you to handle errors that result. So in this case, most of the time, if we're making an external API call, we expect the API we're calling to exist. And so let's just make it so we'll have it for the future. Uh, let's call this as an API. So we're expecting our API to now tell us that it's an API. And if we run this again, we get back the response, this is an API, rather than getting back an error. As you can see, in this case, things just work. And rather than having that red exclamation mark here, we just have a check mark. And this means we can keep going through and building. If we want to, in the future, be able to handle the case where the API does return an error, what we can do is choose to take our HTTP function off the rail. And what you can see now is that instead of returning just the body with the 200, it's now wrapped in an OK. And if we cause an error by getting rid of our information, we get back an error. And so instead of seeing this red dot over here indicating on the rail, we actually get the error response. Uh, response. And then we could write logic to match on the response. Um, we support a variety of patterns. There's more documentation on this. But for me, like in this case, we do usually do OK response destructure it, and then error response. And you could write any other logic you want there too. Particularly cool with this one, uh, you can see here that since our disgrace that we, uh, the most recent response we have was an error, this code is showing that the error ran, and this fade out means that OK didn't run. If we change this, same thing before. We run it, and now you can see instead OK response is highlighted. And so this basically allows you to debug your external API calls pretty quickly to see which part of your dark, which path in your dark code they're going down, and then step by step see what is happening there, where here we can see what our response is, and then we can decide what to do from there. OK. Uh, I think that's the major components I would show of dark specifically for working with ift. Since I mentioned that there is the data store functionality and sometimes you do that, if you wanna have data for some reason, say you're using it to post to your Ift webhook, you're getting something out and then posting it. Um, I'll show you a sample of that later, but make a new data store, make a new data store, not a new function. Um, we can give it a schema. And since I've made it match to what we're putting in, instead of doing this as a response, I can do request dot. And you can see here, um, since I have this incoming data coming in, if you were to post to a dark endpoint from externally rather than the REPL, you would have the same experience where I can see that I want to put the body. Oh, yeah, I want the full body into my data store, where here it's going to use that as my record, just right around and mute the key, tester. And so now what will happen when I call this from this thing is it will call my, extern my API endpoint, and then it will also put this information into the data store, unless I did something wrong. So yep, that seems to have worked. Um, since I'm on Zoom, sometimes these are a little slower to update. But if I refresh, you can see my data store is now locked because it has that data in it. And if you're ever looking to verify that, uh, a REPL works for that too, where I can now get everything from my test data store and see what's there. That's the basics of building up your API endpoints and possibly you'll want a data store that connects to your API endpoint. So now let's do this instead of just from posting within to dark, let's instead also post into ift. So I'm gonna switch over tabs. Um, if you have used if before, what I would recommend doing, if hopefully you have an account, um, you can either watch me do this and we'll give you the video later so you can go back and do it. Or if you want to do it with us, it's at ift.com slash create. And the basic premise behind ift is that you're able to staple two services together. This is really great and you can use this as a non-developer if you don't have any custom logic that you want. But if you want some sort of custom logic, 
there isn't really a way to write that from within if you need a separate web server if it does that. And so that's what we're doing. We're going to connect dark to a webhook in if, and then that webhook will trigger another action. And so this is great for like when you want to be able to tweet something, we'll set up Twitter. Um, I also use it with my personal journal, but if has a giant library of services you can use for the that, and I like setting up dark as the if webhook. So when you're searching, you can just search in here and click webhooks, and then you have to click on this thing again, and then you can give it a event name. And so this is what's what we're going to use to trigger it. Um, so let's say we'll use this first send tweet. That's just a pretty simple one. You'll be able to actually see it working. So we'll create the trigger. And then we have to have a then. And so then what we're going to do is tweet. And we're going to post a tweet. Um, and we get to choose whatever text we want it to be. If has this concept where you can say like what value do you want? So event name, we just said send tweet, which uh, I could probably come up with a funny joke for that, but that's not really what I want. I want to be able to send in custom text and then on the dark side, I can write whatever custom text I want. So we're just going to tweet value one and let that come from dark. There's unfortunately a somewhat limited set of things, but for a lot of these use cases, most of the time, if it's something where you just want to share a amount of data, like value one is a pretty good option. And then you create the action. and finish. Great. So we now have this connection. Um, if we go back, I believe we'll be able to see yeah. um, if we're the FDUI sometimes leaves some things to be desired. But if you want to see all of your applications that use webhooks, which is what I wanted to do, um, you can go to ifts.com slash maker webhooks and you can see both of them. And so you can see here, I have this one that I've built before and I have this one that we just started building. What is sometimes distracting here is you would think that to be able to find out more information about how you call this service with your webhook, it would be within here. What you actually have to do is you have to click on this documentation button, and that documentation button is going to make it really easy for you to copy the URL that you need to post to in order to send to the tweet, and it also provides your API key. And I'm not going to click on it because then I would be showing all of you my API key, and it unfortunately does not have a way to rotate your API key, so I want to avoid doing that. Um, the settings section does something a little bit different too. It just kind of shows you your overall thing. The most useful part of the settings page is you can get your activity log where you can see that we just created an applet. We can also see that I made a similar one earlier to make sure I had the flow working, uh, which I had deleted. And you can see that I did some editing things before and I did some things previously. For instance, this is my other application that runs every day. So this is the best screen for debugging from which is from within the settings and then the activity of your webhooks page. And to get set up, you want to go to the documentation. OK, so now let's go back to dark. And I'll show you what those URLs look like. So you see here I have this if URL. When you go to that documentation page, what it's going to do is it's going to show you a URL that is based on the event that you're triggering, because you can have more than one piece of if functionality. And it's also going to give you your key. And so what I'm going to do is we'll go back over to our main canvas and we'll make an if, if I always think it's IFFT, but it's IFTTT. Um, make an if REPL and we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to do an HTTP client post, uh, but our URL is going to be our if URL, which takes two parameters, the key, which is there, and then the event. And I believe we named our event send tweet. So this will be send tweet. And then we need a body. Um, and this is the part where when you saw before, while we were creating our web applet uh, settings, this piece, it's going to tweet. If we post here, it's going to tweet just value one. So what we're going to do is we're going to give it a JSON value for value one. And this is where we can say whatever we want. And so I guess I'm gonna say, hi, I'm tweeting from showing how to use dark at darkline and shift. And then we don't necessarily need a query and we don't need a header because it's passed and the URL is our key. 
so if I hit this play button, I'm going to expect a tweet to show up on my personal account, and I'm going to expect to get a response in the editor from Ift and see if it's working. So let's give that a go. Hopefully it works. Ooh. We got an error. I guess I'm going to have to go fix my key after this. That's unfortunate. I uh, cannot post slash Twitter slash. Looks like our URL, no, our URL didn't work. Ah, okay. So you can see here, this is one of the things I like the best about this process is because you're getting the real response from the API in line with exactly what you've sent, we can see the problem is we've gotten back, cannot post slash trigger slash send tweet, and then you can see how it blurred into width. And so I have a bug in my URL uh, creation function where I didn't have a trailing uh, leading slash here. So I really encourage you, regardless of what you're building, whether it's within Dark or with an external API, the most useful thing for debugging isn't necessarily going to the browser, or going to the activity log, or going to something else. It's when something doesn't work, going step by step through the live values in the component or in the function you're writing to see what's going on there. So let's try this again. So I'm going to rerun this, and you can see my green play barrel came back because this function has changed since the last time I ran it. And you can see here now I have slash width. So we're going to think this will work. And we say, congratulations, you fired this on tweet event. That's great. Um, so then when we go back to our activity page, we're going to see here our applet was created. Let's see if we actually got a tweet on my Twitter. We've not gotten a tweet yet, which means that something has happened. Go back to our applet, go to our settings, and it says it's never run. So let's view our activity. It says that we managed to post a send tweet. And we got a success. The challenge of doing things live. Check now. Activity. And okay, now it says that we've run. So it's like it said here. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time to run. It usually runs within a few seconds. I might have been being a little bit impatient. Let's head back over to my profile and there you go. We've got it. Someone liked it. David, who I believe is on this webinar, liked it. So that is being able to pretty much immediately write any custom logic you want to be able to show a tweet from Doug. And this doesn't necessarily only work with Twitter. You can basically pick any of the that services from ift and then write your custom logic on the front end. Of course, right here, this isn't very useful because I'm just typing into this rebel box instead of typing into Twitter. Uh, this actually probably would be useful for me because it would prevent me from getting distracted while working if I only tweeted from within dark applications. But you can imagine that what's going to happen instead is you can write any custom logic to generate a value. And so I'm going to show you one that I built ahead of time just because I like it and I think it's a good example of something where I wouldn't run a write a ton of custom logic and I wouldn't be able to do it without ift. So I'll show you an application that I built. Um, I've used an application called day one as my journal for a long time. It's gotten featured in the Mac app store a few times, but it's basically just a really pretty nice journal app. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, this is the app I'll show you that's been posting into here, but it basically it gives you a nice blank screen and it'll tell you how many words you've written. It'll let you put in images. It shows you like a nice calendar view of your journal. I'm not going to show you my journal, uh, but you get the idea. Um, but one of the downsides of using day one as my journal application is it doesn't have a publicly exposed API yet. And so if I want to do something custom with it, I don't have a good way to do that using only a backend, but they did build a if service. But unfortunately, obviously, the if service didn't, uh, they don't have one by default that lets me put random text into my journal. And so what I did was I built an application that uses a webhook and dark to start some default journal entries for me. So this is that application. And so to show you what this does in contrast to the one we just wrote, what this application has is it has a set of reflection prompts, 53 of them. And what happens is that every day, uh, I have this daily cron, which admits that it is a prompt time, and it admits to the background worker prompter. And then what the background worker prompter does is it gets all of the prompts that it could choose out of the data store, 
Uh, so one of all of 53 of the prompts that are on it, you can see it, there we go. It's a full list of things. Then it creates a list of indices, list the length minus one. I think we're actually gonna be adding a db random function because I end up writing this thing a lot. Then it picks a random index for the day. You can see here, today is 46. Tells you which prompts that is. Uh, were you complicit in any gossip today? These prompts are all leadership reflection prompts from a specific book. And then it says, start a journal entry, call my if webhook with the specific prompt, and then returns it. And then uh, this function works exactly like the one we just wrote, where you can see here we're doing an HTTP, an HTTP client post to our webhook URL with a title value and a prompt value. So instead of just using value one, I used value one and value two for that. If I go through and say, it's not the time of the day when I would normally do this, but one of the nice things about testing your application in dark, which I've done a few times, is if I run this cron, everything will step through the entire application. So you can see, um, I don't know if you saw it since they're a little bit overlapping, you can see that less than a minute ago, I got a new event that said that it was prompts time, this code is all going to run. Then if I go back over to my function, my function just ran less than a minute ago. And it's who do I really wish I could think right now. Um, so I'm thankful David went to my tweet and liked it. It felt good that someone was engaging with the stuff I'm doing. Um, and so I can see now that that ran. Similarly, if I go back to the applet for prompt create instead, and I see my activity, run 21 times, you can see that our applet just ran. Is this day? 1030? Yep. We'll get there eventually. Uh, we'll wait for a minute on that. But what happens then when the prompt runs is we will get another thing here. And so I would definitely say that these are a little bit slower than some of the things you would expect of your custom backend because you, you do have the if service running as well but it gives you the ability to make this custom logic on the front end and then be able to integrate to the second service without necessarily having to write a relatively complex set of things or figure out how the other API works because a lot of the basic use cases have been built for you. If you do decide that you wanna do something else that's more complex on the if side or you wanna do part of it with if, but you also wanna write some custom logic, you do always have the option of falling back to the HTTP client library in dark and talking to the second service directly if they have an external API. I suppose I can check now. Check completed. Oh, yep, there we go. Ran, because we're in 23 times, last activity today. We'll view our activity. Just happened, it happened twice, probably because I pressed the button twice. And then, yep, who do I really wish I could think right now? So you see this is now showed up in my desktop journal that has no public API that I would be able to integrate with otherwise. You can also see that I missed a space in my prompt generator, so I'm gonna have to go fix that later. So that gives you an idea of the basic components of Dark, the ability of setting up a super basic webhook from Dark to X, which is basically all you need is Ripple and the URL that's on the documentation page. And then the fact that you can use Dark to build on top of that to write any custom logic you want to generate the values that you're passing into the ift webhook. You know, that was a little bit shorter, but I think that's just because it is actually pretty easy to be able to connect there to ift. Um, so I'll pause there. I don't think we've had any questions so far, but if we have questions, please ask. Or if you have questions about things we didn't necessarily do here, if you want to go into more detail on, say, the error rail or the other pieces of the HTTP client or library, um, I'm happy to do that for a while as well. Quiet today.
Okay. Yep. So there's uh, questions of are there examples of uh, Jarp's usage for building applications that people can look at? And yes, there are definitely examples. We don't have any public if examples yet, although I'm happy to make this one public. Um, the easiest way to see a lot of them is at sampleindex.buildwithdark.com. There's some examples here. Um, this one, for instance, shows the logic necessary to create a Magic 8 ball in your Slack account. So it involves both connecting to the Slack API and generating a random thing like we just did. Um, other examples of this, this is a mobile application that is a mood blogger. So it is a React Native mobile application that runs on iOS and users can update with sets of emojis. And so then it keeps track of the times people have checked in with their mood by their device ID. That's one sample. There's also in the docs themselves, a fair number of tutorials and samples. So this getting started tutorial, um, you can run through if you have a relatively new account, it will have been generated for you automatically at your username dash getting started. So you're able to see it and interact with it without having to build it yourselves. And then there's also these tutorials and samples that are available as well. If there's a specific tutorial or sample that you're looking for that you haven't seen yet, uh, let us know. We're always adding more samples to be available. Yep. And so then there was a question about credentials and keys. Uh, which makes sense since I was chatting about this earlier. So we're looking to build more robust secret storage. The way this works today, um, like you saw me doing before, is I toss them in functions so they're not visible on the main canvas. What we would like to move towards is something that's much more like our password type, where those values are redacted from the analysis and you're not able to see them um, in the editor. And so we are looking to invest in that. And so if that's something that's important, feel free to send us a note in Slack about that. We always like hearing about which things people would prioritize over others since we can only get so much done at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a question about the error statement in here. So you you can, in, like you could, uh, you can look here, I believe. Um, oh, it says 200, so it's not very interesting. Is it? Let's make it something else. Turn this again. Um, so when we get the error back, we do have the code from the error. And so then we could do something like if response.code equals 500 and then give a different error. I, didn't, I don't know why I would want to send back error 500, but we can, you can see we could write some structured logic here for what the response code is. I think we can actually also do nested match. And so forth. So you can see here only a 500 path would be executing. Um, I'm going to answer the Canvas UI question first because this is quicker. Um, the Canvas navigation widget in the bottom, the bottom right that is sometimes there, it only comes up when you are in the function space. And the reason for this was it was originally hacked because people would end up in the function space and not understand that it was the place for reusable functions and think everything else was lost. And so the minimap basically just helps you get back. And so it's just a screenshot of where you were when you last left. Although we have had a fair number of requests for making the minimap more available for navigating larger canvases. And we've been hearing a lot recently as people's services get larger, the canvas becomes a little bit challenging to navigate. Yeah, it's a very popular reference. I've got many plus ones for this. I personally also would like it. I spend a lot of time like flying around trying to find things. Um, Dennis's question about logging and alerts. So this is actually super interesting. I talked to a user this morning who built a full integration between Dark and the Elasticsearch VPN client to like do distributed tracing of what was happening uh, through an application from the front end all the way through Dark. Um, that I think is a little bit overkill right now, especially since the date resolution um, is two seconds right now. It's mostly for web applications, not for that type of logging. 
the other thing that you can do that is often useful is so you could do you can write as much logic as you want here so i could admit to a error handling worker and have it text me right away um, i could also have this Um, I could also call a function as a side effect, and I could have like error handling function here, um, which could then check for something in specific, and I can wrap anything from within an error handling function. So that is something we do a fair amount on a lot of our infrastructure for adding users to Dark is built in Dark, which means that whenever something goes wrong in that process, for instance, like when we used to manually add everyone's account, if you typoed an email address and the email failed, you wouldn't necessarily know right away. And so we wrote custom error handling logic for that as well. Um, another thing people sometimes do is come up with a data store and log every event that happens into that data store so they're able to go back and inspect it. Since they only have a certain number of recent traces, if you want to store more of them, that makes it a little bit easier to debug if something happened further in the past. Oh, uh, in the sample page that has all the dark functions on it, there's a couple of these. So there's, uh, I guess the one I showed earlier today. So there's sample index, which shows a bunch of different sample applications. There's opsdat documentation, dash documentation, which is a programmatically generated page, which shows you every single function that exists. And since you all came to a webinar, uh, non-webinar, I hate the word webinar. Uh, I will show you a work in progress where we do have this sample standard library. And what I'm gradually doing in my downtime is showing how every single function in Dark works. So uh, like if you're not familiar with MAP2, for instance, um, what this does is this is taking in two lists and mapping them together by adding them together. And so it's a lot easier to see what MAP2 does when you can actually see, OK, if I map 2 between 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, it turns into 4, 6, 8. Um, or like MAP2 shortest, I see it just drops that last value. And so we're gradually building this up so people are able to see exactly how each standard library um, function operates without necessarily having to come up with all of it or just figure it out from a doc string. Yeah, we, we manually add things to sample index. And so since this one's a work in progress, it's not on sample index yet because I haven't greenlit it, but it is available. So if you go to this directly, you'll be able to see it. And then I have a question from Jay on recommendations for accessing AWS APIs. Um, yeah, this is a tricky thing. The easiest APIs to integrate from with Dark are when they'll give you a clear, here is the URL for the API. And then you can uh, like just call the URL with the necessary parameters. Um, GCP I might have better information on because Dark's infrastructure runs on GCP, and so we have some Dark services that I believe talk to that. Um, I can ask and follow up on it, but I don't think I have any particular recommendations other than making sure to, if at all possible, try to get the actual endpoints that they want you to call, and then figure out how they want you to authenticate to those endpoints, and then figure out what data to send. Um, we've also before ran into cases where I know for AWS signing, we need a specific um, let me find this in here. There's some specific things, some of the JWT sign in and code functions I know you need for AWS, and so we occasionally end up adding, oh yeah, and there's also an AWS URL and code function. So some of these providers require specific functionality, and if you run into one of the cases of that that's not in the standard library yet, and it's like, I need an AWS blah, blah, blah function, um, if you put it in Slack and tell us what it needs to take and what it needs to return, oftentimes for those functions for connecting to those external services, we can get them built pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I hear the requests around better support for integrating with AWS or GCP. It makes a lot of sense because I mean, you can build one new service here, but if you have a bunch of stuff that's running in an existing provider, you want to be able to talk to it for sure. Uh, would it be helpful to have one of these specifically on the topic of integrating to existing infrastructure like AWS or GCP? Would that be 
a good topic for people. Okay. Um, great. I will, I will look at how we can figure out how to do that. Most of these are based on things that I have built before and I haven't done that yet, but I can definitely go do that and then we can do one of those. Okay, um, any other questions? Or I will give everyone an extra 20 minutes back since it turns out if is actually much simpler than many other things. Oh man, um, it's funny. So since I've been here since the beginning, I've learned Derek very gradually over an extremely long period of time. That from, um, I tweeted a few of these from the Dark account the other day, but Dark itself used to look like a graph. Um, and the live values in Dark used to all display all of the time. So in an application, it wasn't like you would see one thing that was happening. It would be all of these boxes were constantly open. And so it was like really noisy and screaming at you all the time, which is very frustrating. I think probably one of the harder things conceptually is the error rail, um, especially if you're coming from a more imperative background. Um, that's definitely a little bit different because you have to think about like, when do I want to handle my error cases? Do I want to handle them right away? Do I want to do them one at a time? When do I want to go back and make that transition? What does like what is the difference between a just nothing type and an okay error type? And why are there two separate versions of that? Uh, I think it's definitely a little bit intellectually out there. Um, I will admit this came up in the user Slack the other day too. This list sort by comparator, I think, is a pretty challenging concept. Um, and so like occasionally it's just like trying to figure out a very specific function that I haven't used before is challenging. Um, I think one of the things I don't find challenging that other people sometimes find challenging is like the idea of you're shifting the workflow around. And so for me, the ability to say like, I know this is going to work. I know I'm not going to have syntax errors. It bothers me less to not be able to type exactly what I want to type because I know I'm benefiting by not having syntax errors and it's just going to work. Um, anything else anyone would like to know? Great. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. We will release this recording after we get a chance to caption it. We try to caption all of the video content we make so people can watch without sound or for accessibility reasons. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to, you can always reach out to me directly. I'm just Ellen at directlang.com or of course the entire team is in the Slack and happy to answer things. And I'll make sure we figure out a way to do something better around um, connecting to external services, specifically GCP and AWS. Have a great weekend, everyone.